this is a topic that I am really interested in hearing about. Because one of the things I did um, a couple of months ago, as part of my own preparation for this upcoming conference, was I decided that I would keep, just for a week, a diary of what I wasted. And I was totally convinced that I was a very economical user of food. And uh, I, I made a, a scrupulous note of everything which I didn't eat, which I discarded, and of the reason why I felt I had to discard it. And I found that in a very short space of time, I was making excuses as to, well, actually, what well, was quite reasonable that I would discard it. I mean, it didn't really have to count in my diary because it was an exceptional circumstance, um, etc., etc., etc. So. I'm really pleased that we're addressing this topic of waste this evening, and I feel that I am going to learn a lot from it. Um, and it's a pleasure to introduce Stephen, Stephen Finn. I'm not going to give you uh, chapter and verse as to all the wonderful things he's done, because it's all there for you in the orange book. But just to give you a, f a few, uh, a little flavour of his background and why he's such a great person to be talking to us about this. So um, Stephen actually worked for 25 years in the supply chain sector, but for the last few years his focus has been on sustainability issues and with a particular emphasis on the matter of, of waste. And he founded a, um, what is it, a company, a unit response ecology, which uh, has a name of changing uh, management practice to encourage sustainability and to, as part of this he also teaches courses for uh, innovative thinking in sustainability and as I say with a particular in a particular focus on the matter of waste and managing the managing waste sounds sort of peculiar but addressing this issue because actually it is a huge issue waste of food so I think that we're going to learn a lot this evening. I think we're going to be challenged about our own wastage. And so without more ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Stephen Finn to you. Um, so we're going to talk about um, 
global food waste, we're going to talk about change, we're going to talk about the opportunity to do something about this. Um, we'll also talk about collaboration, uh, potential partnerships, and uh, the urgency that's needed. Um, 2050, we, we, we have talked a little bit about um, 9 billion by 2050, uh, a little bit this week. It's only 35 years away. Um, so it's a scary problem, it's a daunting problem. Um, and just stop and think for a minute, it's only 35 years away, and uh, that should get us a little more concerned about it. Um, so with that, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll press ahead. Um, so my goal tonight is to, um, as, as Pat just alluded to a little bit, um, educate you a little bit on this topic, um, and, uh, and make you change agents, uh, hopefully, to where you go around and uh, and does that tally the next time around and show it to other people and ask them what they're doing about uh, food waste in their, in their uh, personal lives too. Um, I've been playing too much with Wordle lately. Um, I find it a fascinating tool to organize uh, one's thoughts. And so you saw this in the beacon today. This uh, is a Wordle diagram of the, uh, of the paper that I did to accompany this, uh, this talk. But you quickly get a sense of some of the key phrases that we're going to talk about tonight, food waste. Um, 9 billion by 2050 problem, global issues, need for change, need for urgency. Um, so we'll cover all that um, tonight. So, um, so we definitely it's a problem that we definitely need change. Uh, the good news, I think, um, when you think about it this way, is um, we have to create successful change here um, because really we don't have much choice. Um, so. Um, it's a daunting problem we face to be 9 million by, by 2050, and so we'll talk about the changes, a little bit of uh, the change that's needed to, to get there. Um, I always like to start with um, key takeaways, so um, if you don't listen to anything else tonight, um, just this slide, these four or five points here, uh, here are the takeaways from tonight. Um, uh, we touched on this a little bit this week, uh, worldwide, and we have a massive hunger problem, and we have massive global food waste that goes along with that. So if you view those two things together, um, we really have a serious disconnect. Um, and I think uh, our values uh, related to food are, are way out of balance. Um, we've, we've lost touch with the value of our food, uh, and I think that is to the serious detriment of, uh, of people on the planet. Um, the current waste, the state of waste, pollution, and hunger is unsustainable. Um, I think that, at least from my perspective, might make it into the declaration at the end of this week. Um, and then, um, in terms of opportunity, again, as I said, 9 million by 2050, I think provides a critical opportunity for the world to come together. Uh, to do that, I think we're going to need a, a global network that focuses on shared values, uh, and we better do it quick. There's a lot of urgency involved here. So um, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures like this. Um, this is the trash bin behind a, a uh, pretty high-end supermarket close to my house. Um, I literally, as my children can tell you, have hundreds of these pictures. Uh, they are um, very easy to get. Um, the best time to get them is in Sunday afternoon during football season because there's nobody around and you can go and, and take pictures to your heart's content. Um, it is uh, a serious, uh, it's too bad uh, that it's so easy for me to get pictures like this and uh, you know there's there's some really high quality material in here that food in here that um, I'm going to touch on but uh, you'll see a lot of pictures like this. Um, so let's look at a little historical perspective um, at food waste in the United States. We'll start, we'll start there. Um, there's a, a 1970 study, 77 study that uh, estimated that 20% of the food that we produced um, was lost. And at that time, it was 137 million tons and a value of $31 billion. Um, two decades later, there was another study. Uh, and at that point, um, the study indicated that we moved up to 27% of food available for human consumption was wasted, and uh, that was estimated to be uh, 96 billion pounds annually. So, some of these numbers are so big, it's just hard to get your, your head around them, but we'll, we'll try. Um, a big study um, last year, uh, just issued by the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, noted that 40% uh, of the food in the U.S. Uh, is not eaten. So uh, if you put that in an individual perspective, it's about 20 pounds of food per person per month, and uh, the value's now gone up to $165 billion, so annually. So I think about this, and we've made a lot of advances in the United States since the 70s. Uh, in terms of food waste, we have regressed uh, seriously. So if you look globally, um, 
tell you that Pat's kind of before. Um, we started in the UK. Um, RAP is a big organization that does a lot of measurement work in uh, food waste in the UK. Um, RAP noted that almost 7 billion tons of food uh, per year go to waste in the UK, about 33% of consumer purchases. Um, and interesting points, with proper management, um, they felt that 60% of that food could have been eaten. And then a real staggering one, about 25% of that was discarded uh, in a hole or an open state. So um, <coughs> when I think about that, the word uh, cavalier comes to mind. Um, so we're awfully cavalier about uh, what we do with our, with our food. Um, a study by the uh, Stockholm International Water uh, Institute uh, noted that food losses and food waste could be as much as uh, be as high as 50 percent uh, from the field of fork, and that study has had a lot of attention too. Um, if you want to look up on our website, this paper, you can see a little a little bit more detail about how they get there. Um, they start out at 4,600 calories, and they get down to about 2,000 calories uh, at consumption at the point of consumption. Um, FAO, I'll do a lot of uh, FAO um, studies tonight. Um, FAO noted that about one third of all the uh, food produced for human consumption goes to waste annually. Um, big numbers again now are up to 1.3 billion tons annually. Okay, so take that 1.3 billion and multiply that by 2,000. Big numbers, even bigger. So if you put dollars to that, um, FAO notes that in developing countries that's about 680 billion dollars a year. And if you add developing countries, that's $310 million a year, combine those, um, and you're at a trillion dollars <laughs> waste and food losses. So, off the big number, as uh, Sadeb said the other day, a lot of zeros behind these numbers. Um, pretty shocking. Let's look at where that occurs uh, and, and by product type. Um, again, from FAO, um, these percentages are all very high. You can see that fruits and tubers and fruits and vegetables, uh, nearly 50% of those products are wasted. Fish and seafood, about 35%. Dairy products, um, about almost 20%. So these are all very high um, percentages by food type. And when I think about that, I think uh, one word that comes to mind is unconscionable. You know, when you're talking about food waste of this magnitude. Um, a study by the IME uh, this year thought it was in a great perspective. It said uh, there's the potential to provide 60 to 100 percent more food by simply eliminating losses while simultaneously freeing up land, energy, and water resources for other uses is an opportunity that should not be ignored. And I think that's a great way to look at um, you know, the great amount of waste um, that we have right now and what you know what we can what we should be thinking about in terms of getting that way people by 2050. So what are some of the causes of that food waste? Um, I'm sure we have some people that um, spent some time in, in farms in their youth, and, in their youth, and it's all did. Um, start, start with nature. Um, you know, obviously, extreme weather, pests um, would come to mind for most of us immediately. Um, regulations are an issue, too. Um, uh, loss in transport, loss on the farm in terms of damage from machinery, um, loss during food, uh, food prep and conversion. Supply and demand um, issues and the variability in trying to match up supply with demand, very difficult to do in the food sector. Um, another big problem. Uh, at the consumer level, plate waste, um, you know, in situations where buffet mentality and situations like this where we have a, a great amount of food to eat, um, there's, it, it tends to lead to a lot of, of waste as well. Um, but the one out here that I really want to what I'm going to talk about more tonight is uh, overly selective quality standard, standards. And I'll talk, talk about this in terms of the quest for perfection that we as American consumers uh, and, and others industrialized nations have, which leads to a lot of waste. Um, in terms of where that food waste uh, occurs, um, in, in developing countries, um, there's a lot of waste that occurs between production and market. Um, in industrialized countries, and developed, um, a lot of that waste occurs at market. So uh, there's a difference in where it occurs, but um, when you total it all up, it's about the same, about 40% in both um, in both groups. And we'll get into the <laughs> details of that. Um, in developing countries, um, as you might imagine, lack of infrastructure is a critical factor. Um, and two things that you need to uh, to move food to market um, quickly and, and in a safe state. Um, Good transportation systems and, uh, and good refrigeration, and those are lacking in developing countries. Um, no surprise there. So you have a lot of material that's lost in transit. Um, 
But the interesting thing is once it gets to market in developing countries, um, it tends to be consumed and it doesn't go to waste because simply it's too valuable. And I think we could, we could all take a lesson from that in, uh, in industrialized countries. Here we have, uh, as we talked about earlier this week, we have highly efficient transportation systems. We can move food from thousands of miles um, every day very quickly. We can fly in and bring them by ship. Um, so food comes from great distances to get here. Um, and we're very efficient at that. Um, but once it gets to the market, uh, once it gets to our location, we tend to, to waste a lot of it. Um, part of that is um, you know, we have a system where uh, consumers expect um, fully stocked shelves at all times. And so when, when we walk into the supermarket at 11 o'clock, we expect 37 varieties of bread. Um, and we expect them to all be fresh. And at 12 o'clock, when the store closes, um, as a result of that, a lot, a lot goes to waste. We also expect what I call perfect produce. Um, and, you know, the system is, is built to provide uniformity. Um, so um, pieces of fruit, pieces of uh, vegetables that are too big, too small, a little misshapen, uh, don't even make it to market. So they get culled out ahead of time. Um, so there's a, a lot of oversupply. There's this demand for uniformity. Um, leads to a lot of waste um, at market, and what we don't even see it leads to a lot of waste before, um, before market because it's cold out. Um, the result of that, um, we love to walk into, uh, and I do too, uh, we love to walk into supermarkets and see fully stacked uh, produce uh, shelves like uh, we see on the left. Um, and the cost of that is a lot of waste in the back. Um, you know, bins full of, full of fruit and full of vegetables that were deemed a little bit beyond their prime, which in many cases is questionable. Um, what happens to those chickens that uh, spin on the rotisserie um, for four hours? About four hours and 15 minutes, they're pulled off and they go into the trash in a lot of cases. Um, I took this picture in the winter. The steam was still coming off of these when, uh, when I took this picture. Um, I could have taken about 15 of these home very easily. Um, so a lot of waste in, in that area too. Um, so again, developing nations, infrastructure is key. In industrialized nations, um, a lot of this waste stems from uh, a culture of abundance and, and really what I would say is, is apathy, um, which, which we can change. Um, this culture of abundance that I keep talking about is really, I like to say it's, it's an illusion, it's a, it's a myth. Um, Tristram Stewart, author of a book called Waste, uncovering the global food scandal that is better than anyone I've, I've ever seen and said, Industrialized nations need to learn what it means to live in scarcity because the appearance of infinite abundance is an illusion. And I think it's a great way to think about this topic. Um, resources are finite, they're not going to last forever. Um, we're already seeing signs of, um, of scarcity in a lot of resources, and uh, we need to do something about that. Um, so, how much do we value our food? I think that's a critical question here. Um, all of this waste that you've seen so far you know, kind of leads one to think how much do we value our food? And really, beyond that, the resources that go into producing it. Um, how often do we consider the, you know, the weaknesses of the food system and all the, the waste that results? I think these are questions that um, we need to be asking ourselves, um, both in groups like this and at universities and at a much higher level in government all, all across the country and globally. Um, and I'm stunned by the fact that food waste um, is a topic that is largely below the radar, in my opinion. Um, it's not a mainstream issue in industrialized nations. Um, we spend a billion dollars a year in the U.S. to um, to discard um, food waste, um, and you know I, I watched a little bit in the last election to see if anything would come up, and I never heard any reference to it. Um, so I think it needs to become a part of national and, and global uh, agendas, and I'll talk about that a little, a little bit too. So, so Sal, that's the scope. So I'm going to talk about the significance of global food waste too. Um, and I, I think about this, it has, it has a distinct bearing on the two most pressing issues of our time, which I would say are poverty and hunger, and the environment. Um, and there's a, there's a direct link between uh, food waste and those two issues, I think. Um, in terms of global hunger, you know, nearly a billion people on the planet hungry. We talked about that this week. 12.5% of the global population um, were under nurse from, from 2010 to 2012. Um, as you all know, about 98% of those individuals live in developing countries, um, and two billion out of seven people on the planet, seven billion people on the planet, um, now facing you know, one or more micronutrient deficiencies right now. So, um, pretty significant um, 
in terms of global hunger. Um, in the U.S., say that, uh, look more closely uh, at home for a minute. Um, you know, shocking statistics as well. 50 million Americans, one in six, living in food insecure households. 17 of them, million of them children, 5 million of them seniors. Um, in a recent study put out by UNICEF, uh, <coughs> uh, relative child poverty um, among industrialized nations in the U.S. ranked 34 out of 35 um, on that study. So um, we're talking about the most prosperous nation on, on the planet here. So um, it doesn't, it, it really shows you how serious um, hunger problems are in the, in the U.S. as well. Um, Great significance in terms of lost calories, um, wasted food with food prevents um, needed calories um, from reaching people that need them, reaching the need. Um, and another statistic from, from FAO, if we could save just one quarter of the food that uh, is currently going to waste annually, um, it would be enough to feed um, all of the people uh, across the globe. So pretty, pretty amazing when you think about the scale. Um, also, in terms of significance, it's not just the food, but it's the, it's the nutrients, uh, it's the quality of that food. Um, all too often, very high quality calories go to waste. Um, it's very easy for me to find this. Um, a couple of shots here, um, ribeye steaks, um, strip steaks, um, spare ribs, uh, hamburger on the left side, um, beautiful strawberries, uh, potatoes, peppers, all kinds of vegetables on the right side. So, uh, again, it, those are high-quality calories for people um, in, uh, in areas like food deserts need. We talked about obesity this week. Barry talked about it. Sandy talked about it a little bit. Um, you know, alarming statistics in the U.S. More than a third of Americans obese. 17% um, of them children. Um, rates have skyrocketed, um, doubling in children, tripling in adolescents in the last 30 years. Um, so those high-quality calories that we're talking about here could go a long way, I think, toward um, mitigating the, the problems that occur in food, um, in food deserts in this, in this country. Um, and let's get into the environmental factors, which are, which are serious, too. Um, agriculture, um, the biggest user of water. Someone mentioned, I think Bob mentioned yesterday, uh, yesterday that um, you know, water is going to be the key issue uh, in the next several decades, and in my mind, there's no question that that's the case. Um, you know, agriculture uses about 70% of the water that's consumed uh, on the planet annually. Um, so it's very safe to say that wasted food is wasted water. Um, when we waste food, we waste a lot of water. Um, and here's how they owe again, the loss of water through food waste would easily meet the household water needs of the 9 million people expected on the planet in 2050. Um, and I like that one because that's a great way to look at this problem. So it's forward, it's looking forward. Um, it's saying we have great needs in 2050, um, and what we're doing now, um, you know, could go a long way toward. We fixed it. Could go a long way toward, toward helping to solve that problem. Um, I was encouraged um, yesterday, uh, the day before, people were were asking where the word sustainability was uh, in, in some documents, and that's that's the way we need to think. We need to be thinking along those lines, in my opinion. Um, Wasted food is, uh, equals air pollution, no question about it. Um, Tom, Tom's here from EPA, um, EPA knows a lot about this. Um, food waste is a um, major component of um, what comprises our landfills in this country. Um, it uh, produces global, uh, it produces uh, methane gas as it decomposes, which is uh, 20 to 25 times more harmful, or more, uh, 20 to 25 times more global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So uh, it's a serious, uh, contributor to, uh, to climate change. Um, so decreasing the amount of food waste uh, in landfills would, would be a very positive thing for us to accomplish. Um, wasted food is also wasted energy. Again, from FAO, um, U.S. food waste alone represents three, uh, 300 million barrels of oil per year. 4% um, of our nation's oil use, that's a big number. Um, and again, we're spending, as I said before, we're spending uh, more resources to, uh, to haul that food waste away to landfills as well. So, pretty frightening stats there. Anyone, uh, how many people have grown up on a farm? How many people have grown up on a farm? They didn't understand what you asked. Okay. Did anyone with a farm background, did, uh, you know, wasted food, so wasted food equals wasted resources, right? Um, 
think about all those agricultural in inputs that went uh, into producing food that goes to waste. Uh, fertilizer and pesticides come to mind. But think about all the labor that was uh, went into that food. Think of all the planning. Think of all the human capital um, that went into it. So it's a tremendous waste of resources as well. Um, serious impact on soils. Um, wasted food really causes, um, you know, is tied to uh, soil depletion. Um, and we had a look at this. Um, the meats and the dairy products wasted uh, in the U.S. and the U.K. alone require 8.3 million hectares. Um, and since we're in New York, um, I thought I'd write that to New York. That's about two thirds the size of the state of New York. So uh, pretty um, compelling statistics there. Um, and this press for land is from Stewart does a great job on this too. This press for land dis disrupts the climate, disrupts the hydrological cycles. Um, and as he says, threatens to reduce the productivity of land, land by 25 percent this century. And when you think about that, at a time when we're gearing up toward to um, handle another two billion people, so just at the time when we need to uh, maximize the productivity of our food production, we're threatening the very soils that produce it. So a scary thought. Uh, in terms of the impact of land, wasted food um, results in increased landfill use. Um, food that doesn't go to compost. Uh, uses up limited space, it's unsightly, it smells, but it also increases landfill requirements. And uh, landfill requir landfills end up polluting ground, groundwater. Um, and as we said before, pollute, uh, pollute the air too. So a lot of prop environmental problems associated with that. So when I step back and I think about all this, I kind of view the food system as a dysfunctional circle. Um, we produce vast quantities of food in this global food system. We go to great effort to distribute it, store it, stage it for sale, um, and then somewhere through that process, a lot of that food uh, passes our quality standards, um, and we end up discarding it. We spend even more resources to haul it away, um, and we put it into a landfill where it causes even more problems for us as it decomposes. So, um, not a great picture. We lose half uh, food all, all along the way as we do that. So the impact of that, um, we're producing more than we need. We're using limited uh, valuable finite resources in the process to produce food that we eventually discard. Um, in the final stages of that, we inflict more harm on the environment um, by disposing of it and bringing that back to uh, people who fail to make use of a billion tons of food annually that could go toward um, feeding people. Um, when I think about that, how many people Think back to that circle, how many of us would knowingly work um, eight hours a day to produce ten items, knowing that at the end of the day we would throw out five of them, we would pay money to throw them to have them all the way, and we would inflict more harm on the environment uh, in doing so, um, and keep that resources away from people that need it. So it's kind of crazy. Um, so the result of all that, again, as we talked about, waste of nutrition, waste of resources, um, there's some shots behind markets, um, uh, farmers markets, supermarkets, and uh, in community gardens even where you would expect to see um, waste of food. Um, typically, some of the findings that I come across, um, you know, it's bad enough. For, you know, I mentioned before, our supermarkets stock a lot of bread, um, a lot of um, baked goods, donuts, bagels, Danish. Um, so you can find those very easily. It's, it's bad enough to, to find those um, because there's a lot of resources going to waste there. Um, but far worse is when you see all kinds of shots of, um, of very high quality calories in terms of uh, fresh fruit and, uh, and produce going to waste. Um, very disconcerting. Um, and last, in terms of significance, we have to think about this in terms of global security. Um, so how secure are, is a world where we have you know, a billion people hungry um, living in communities next to one, next to people who are, um, you know, who have plenty, who have excess. Um, as someone mentioned earlier this week, you know, where it's a world where obesity and hunger coexist. And uh, that's not the recipe for a secure world. Um, Sal talks often about, um, uh, about um, social unrest being linked, uh, you know, almost always being linked to, to food crises. And, and uh, so it's a, it's a Food insecurity is a definite problem uh, in terms of global security, and uh, you know it's it's not just a problem for uh, less developed countries. 
And I think there's a moral problem here, which I think everyone can relate to. Um, we talked this week about you know all individuals having a basic right to food and to adequate nutrition. I think that will probably come out of the declaration to some degree. Um, and yet we discard these immense quantities of food enough to totally eliminate hunger yearly. Um, so on, on moral grounds around uh, moral grounds alone, I'd say that producing food waste should be a global priority. So to sum all of that up, I think there's a big disconnect here, as I said earlier. Um, we waste these vast quantities of food. We have one in eight across the globe hungry. Um, we still need to feed another two billion by 2050, only 35 years away. Um, our resources are severely challenged now. Um, the environment is in, you know, is already suffering from you know, our current system. And we need to find um, sustainable ways to close that calorie gap that's anticipated between now and 2050. So what do we do about all this? It's a pretty scary picture. Um, I, I think, um, as I've been reflecting on this for the last several months, um, typically when you talk about the 9 billion by 2050 problem, um, it's a serious problem, it's a daunting challenge. Um, and I started to think that, um, I think we need to reframe a little bit. I think we need to look at the 9 billion by 2050 problem as an opportunity. Um, it needs an effective global network to, uh, to address it, to be able to help us provide food um, in a secure way for, for that vast number of people. To get there, we need to, to focus on the opportunity, um, and we need to think you know, along sustainability lines, and we need to have a urgency. But I think we all need to transform our mindset to, to one of uh, embracing this as an opportunity to uh, create a more secure world, um, and a better role for, for everyone by the time 2050 gets here, which is not that far away. Um, as I said before, food waste, global food waste is not a mainstream issue, and I think part of this is we need to make it a uh, mainstream issue. Um, I think the fact that it is not to date shows that um, you know, there's a lack of understanding of the, of the social, the environmental, the economic um, benefits that um, we could attain by reducing food waste. So I think we need to make it a much more mainstream issue. Um, and I think we need to um, really get uh, in on board in terms of creating increased awareness of the scale of this problem uh, among, amongst consumers, business, governments, and we need to then take that awareness and translate it into tangible action um, as part of this broad collaborative effort that we're talking about to, um, to help optimize resources and help get us to a secure world by 2050. Um, Awareness and education are key uh, at the start. Um, and people need to, to understand that we have choices right now regarding access food. Um, EPA does a nice job of putting a hierarchy on their website and getting a word out about that. Um, you know, the best thing we can do is not waste it in the first place, but once we produce it, um, you know, there are other options besides throwing it out, surely feeding hungry people, feeding animals, industrial uses, composting. The last thing we want to do is throw it in a landfill where it causes more problems for us. So how do we make this second nature for all? I think that's part of that mainstream process. Um, and go further and create partnerships that, that um, capture some of this excess food and put it to good use. Um, I think doing that requires that we all think about food much differently than we are today. Uh, I think we need to value our resources much more. Um, Someone mentioned the short term versus the long term focus earlier this week. Definitely need a more long term view um, in our economic system. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and again, to get to get more mainstream on this, we need we need mind, mindset change. We need um, we need people thinking more about um, planet um, and the environmental issues and the social issues of all of this food waste. Um, you know, to make some headway in this in this area. Um, as part of this process, um, you know, change is hard. There's always barriers to overcome. Um, I mentioned this lack of awareness before. Um, I think there's a lack of concern amongst you know, most in the you know, mainstream countries, people, um, mainstream America. There's a lack of concern about global food waste, and I think that really stems from a lack of awareness. So, um, creating that awareness is, is going to be key toward moving, making positive change against this problem. Um, I think that I've, I've heard also that you know there's a, a view that um, you know, food waste and non-million food waste issues um, it's a problem for the next generation. 
um, environmental issues are coming to the next generation. I, I, that's not a, a mindset that we can afford, I don't think. Um, we need to think more long term. Um, when creating partnerships, um, there, are, there are barriers to overcome too. There's, there's a fear of liability. There's a fear that some of these partnerships to capture excess food and redistribute it um, is just too difficult. Um, it's in the way of my current operations. It's going to be too costly to me. So we need to get by that. Um, and part of that, I think, is um, you know, discarding food in this country is just far too easy, and we're just geared toward doing it. Um, so uh, change in that area would be helpful. And uh, you know, I think one key thing also is there's, there's been an unwillingness to move away from this current economic model that we have, which is um, you know, it doesn't factor in the environmental externalities associated with things like food waste. And, um, so we need to get there, too. I'll talk about that in a minute. So we need urgent change. Um, I think that food waste needs to get on um, the national agenda, and I think it also needs to become a global priority. Um, to do that, I think it needs a global network approach, um, which is going to involve collaborative partnerships um, and a sense of urgency. Um, there was a, an individual, John Richard, about 10 years ago, wrote a paper called The New Global Agenda. And um, he listed 20 uh, of what he thought were the key global, most pressing global problems. Um, I listed several of them there. And he talked about a new framework for attacking them. And I was struck by the fact that, on the left side there, um, how many of them, I mean, his first eight really, uh, related to uh, anyone who was somewhat tied to food waste. Um, global warming, fisheries depletion, deforestation, water issues, um, you know, safety issues of society related to food security. Um, so I think he, he was spot on in terms of saying that we needed a, a new global network to, um, to attack these problems. Um, and I was thinking about that. Um, you know, he calls for, for network teams. Um, you know, this has an appeal to universal values. Um, it has an appeal toward global citizenship. Um, so in many ways, you know, it can help bring the world closer together. Um, so again, I think he had a, a great concept there. I was thinking about this in terms of um, another book that I read, The, the End of Poverty by Eunice. And uh, part of that book, uh, he talked about a great crisis offers great opportunity. And I was putting those two themes together. And, and you know, I think that global food waste definitely is, is intertwined with the dual problems of hunger and the environment as we talked about. And so, I, as I said before, I think we need to start thinking about food waste as a huge opportunity in the context of, uh, of the 9 billion by 2050 problem to, to both eliminate hunger um, and to optimize resources and, and save the environment so that um, when we do get to 2050, we have not only adequate food, but we have um, safe environment in which to live. Um, I think if you look at that just alone in terms of 9 million by 2050, it can be difficult to, to, to think about it in terms of how to advance that cause. And so I think there's benefit to breaking it down into, into pieces. And I, I worked on this for a while, and I listed 10, 10 ways that I thought we could advance um, make headway against 9 million by 2050 in terms of reducing global food waste. And, and I'm sure you could come up with some more, maybe you will tonight. Um, but I just want to go through some of those. Um, first one, you know, expand, always, you know, beginning with awareness. I think um, you know, we can expand national and global awareness um, and, and up our education efforts on food waste. Um, I think there's a, there's a suppressed discomfort that we have with food waste. We know it's wrong. We tend to waste a lot of it when we're uncomfortable about talking about it. So I think more awareness will, will help people come to grips with that and, and take action to reduce their, their individual behavior. Um, I think definitely need action to change this cultural and culture of abundance that I, I mentioned earlier. Educate people on the value of food. Um, I think we need a, a new compact between consumers and retailers where consumers um, shouldn't expect to have 37 choices of bread at 10.30 o'clock at night that are perfectly fresh, and, uh, and they shouldn't expect perfectly uniform produce um, 24 hours per day. Um, they, should, they should be willing to accept a, a variety. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's all nutritious food, and, and uh, it doesn't 
and zucchini doesn't want to be exactly eight inches long. If it's uh, ten or if it's six, it's still going to provide high nutrition content. So um, I think that if, if consumers are educated and more willing to accept um, less than perfect produce and uh, willing to accept less than fully stocked shelves at all times, I think uh, they can drive change amongst uh, retailers, and I think that's important and important place to start. Um, I think, as I mentioned a little bit, we can view this problem as, as a great way to make inroads toward eliminating hunger. Um, it's something that we have to do. Um, there's, a, there's a great need to think more long term on this, and there's a great need to create partnerships to capture um, excess food and to do uh, and to put that food to good use. It's something that I've done in Pennsylvania. Um, and Bill is, is well familiar with uh, his organization does this all the time. <coughs> Doug Rouse is doing great work on this in Boston. Um, um, Tom is great work on this with, uh, with EPA. So there are, there are lots of opportunities to create partnerships to create um, food waste. Tomorrow, um, a recent class that I, that I taught, um, the class's focus was to create uh, an awareness campaign on food waste. And they spent the semester um, doing that. They put on an event, uh, an event on campus at Penn that was very successful. They had donated food that would put down the waste. <coughs> passed it out to students on campus and, and made two videos to, uh, about the, the process and the theme, and it was very successful. Um, they had a lot of both local and global reach, so um, we need more, more, more projects like that, I think, too. But, um, one key thing is we need a global commitment to eliminate poverty and hunger, um, and I think we have a great incentive to do that in terms of the 9 million by 2050 problem. Um, we saw some of the environmental problems caused by food waste, um, so I think another opportunity here is to embrace this, this uh, challenge as uh, a way to make significant com uh, contributions to the environment. Um, you know, this rising population puts great strain on, on resources. We're going to have two billion more people. Many of them will be uh, you know, entering the middle class who have more um, purchasing power than they had before, so they're going to put even more strain on unlimited resources. Um, so uh, that's not yet another opportunity. Um, another way to look at this is to see it as a, a challenge to make inroads on obesity and health. Um, you know, obesity uh, currently costs me, you know, recent costs of $147 billion per year. We, we simply can't afford that, as we mentioned earlier this month, and, you know, as well as the lost productivity and the lost um, you know, the, the, health issues, the other health issues that result from that. Um, so capturing, redirecting excess food can really um, help mitigate the problems of food deserts, I think, and, um, um, and help make inroads on obesity and health issues. Um, it also provides a great opportunity to build community at a great, a much greater level. Someone stopped me from uh, food bank earlier today and talked about building community. And this is a great way to look at this uh, issue too. Uh, it's not only local community, which is great, but it's building nations, bring nations together in a global effort to, to solve a problem that everyone has a vested interest in solving, right? So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to, to create unprecedented, unprecedented collaboration. Uh, and, and really, um, we should be well motivated to do it because the fate of the planet um, really depends on it. Um, innovative partnerships, I, I mentioned before, um, it's a great opportunity to, to bring people to the, together to develop partnerships to, uh, to capture food and put it to good use. Um, there's, there's much potential to do that. There's a lot of people, as we saw, that def, you know, desperately need high quality calories. You know, as part of that, I think we can create really effective national and global awareness campaigns to help with that. Um, I haven't talked too much about business, um, but this is a great way to harness the power of business as well. Business has the incentive to uh, embrace sustainability initiatives. Um, it's crucial for, for the survival of business. Um, so, my by 2050 presents great opportunities for business to uh, to get involved and, and, and make contributions to both people and the planet. Um, it's a great way to, to move toward a new economic system, I think, too. Um, we talked earlier today about you know environmental costs not getting factored into um, the business equation. Um, we're in this you know, take make waste uh, model where. Um, we, take inputs, we produce a product, and we harm the environment and, we, uh, and produce, producing outputs um, that are you know, negative impact on the environment. Um, there's a, a, a theme out there, you know, capitalism 3.0, which uh, you know, 
talks more about mimicking nature, um, taking inputs from one process and, uh, and using them, um, taking outputs from one process and making inputs from another. So um, it's more regenerative, uh, it's less, uh, you know, it doesn't harm the environment. Um, as Charmer says at MIT, it's more of uh, an ecosystem awareness model versus an ecosystem awareness model. So, um, good potential for, for business to em embrace more of a capitalist 3.0 uh, model. I think it's a great opportunity to scale up um, and, and get some experience in, in coordinating large events. I was thinking about this in terms of the Olympic Games. You know, every four years the world comes together and we put on this great show. Um, and there's typically lots of accolades given to the people that organize that. And it involves tremendous collaboration, uh, bringing together huge amounts of resources and energy in there. Um, what better um, project to do to bring worldwide resources together than, than you know, reducing food waste and trying to, to uh, make contributions to the 9 billion by 2050 problem. Someone mentioned earlier today, uh, or earlier this week, um, you know, programs to put people uh, who are out of work or looking for work. Um, to work in terms of capturing food, um, uh, you know, there are opportunities, I think, for New Deal type programs to do that, so um, we can think along those lines as well. Uh, and last, I think just a, it's a huge opportunity to change the world for the better. Um, you know, again, minimizing global food waste, there's great opportunities for hunger uh, and for improving the environment um, and creating a more secure world for everyone. So um, I think about this in terms of Crowdsourcing with Uber purpose, right? It's a great way to bring the entire world together to unleash its creative value um, and create a potential for good value, good purpose. Um, so to conclude and get back to the takeaways earlier, um, you know, the food waste, is, it's an enormous problem. It's definitely linked to the problems of hunger uh, and the environment that we face today. I think our values are, are just way out of balance right now. I think we've lost uh, touch with the value of our food, as I said earlier. Um, and that has serious implications for, for the planet uh, and for the 870 million people that are hungry. Um, I think the current state of waste, pollution, and hunger is unsustainable. Um, again, we're going to have to deal with two, 2 million more people here in 35 years with increased purchasing power. Um, so we need to, uh, to change our behavior now. We got to have to be ready to handle that. Um, we simply can't afford to waste 30 to 50 percent of our food. Um, any longer, we can't afford the environmental impacts that that waste um, uh, provides. We need urgent change now. I think, I think looking at a collaborative global network uh, of, a, of a very grand scale, with, uh, which harnesses a lot of expertise amongst business, individuals, governments, um, acting with urgency, acting with shared purpose, um, is what's needed. Um, like, uh, it's, it's definitely a key thing to, uh, to embrace globally right now um, in order to create a more secure world. Um, it's an essential journey that um, all nations are going to need to participate in. Um, and it's an opportunity that um, I don't think uh, can be missed. It's, it's something that I think we just have to do. Um, that's it. I was, I ended up, I, I began by feeling totally overwhelmed with all the facts and figures because they're just so staggering. They're just so staggering and I was, I was trying to send some tweets as well and I was, I was just thinking, oh this is such a bad statistic, I, I just have to make a record of this and then the next one's even worse and there was a moment when I felt, what can we do? I just kind of submerged under this great weight of wasted food. And I just felt, oh. But then I really was encouraged by the way you ended, actually. And I really like that idea of turning the problem into a series of opportunities as a way of getting a handle on that and of finding something that you can get a grip onto and a way into 
thinking about it positively. So I just want to say thank you for that, because I found that really helpful. And uh, there's one thing that I have felt this week is, uh, you know, as we listen to these presentations, you just can feel totally helpless in the face of all the, all the information and uh, think that we do, there's nothing we can do about it. But I thought that you gave a really kind of good, encouraging, you know, think creatively, think positively, see this as an opportunity and get stuck in there and, and work at it like that. And I personally find that really encouraging. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions. I had some as you were kind of uh, working through, but uh, it would be great to take some questions. So do you want to take, um, uh, okay, all right. So let's do the usual thing, come up to the microphone. And, oh, there's a really key, I see there's a talking, I didn't even notice. Okay, here's the microphone, without more ado. We're going to leave the microphone here so that you can actually yeah, see. see it. Please identify yourselves. Okay. Um, my name is Solomon Katz, and uh, uh, my name is Hugh Joseph. I appreciate your presentation. I agree totally with the need and the importance of reducing and trying to eliminate waste in every way possible. But I can't say that I agree with your overall premise here, that there's a real connection between the waste we have throughout the food supply and the elimination or reduction of hunger uh, currently or in the long term. It, you know, you can you can say that if we could find ways to modify safety regulations and so on and get some of the food that gets thrown away at events and bring that to homeless shelters and so on, we could feed some hungry people. I, I would accept that as a, as a small step, but we're talking about large-scale global hunger um, in, in 2050. Let's look at it in, in 2013. We produce enough food right now to feed everybody in the world. And the fact that a lot of it goes to waste um, is not, does not mean that if it didn't go to waste, those people would get fed. And most of us know that uh, solutions to hunger are, are much more complex and, and, and you do too. So the question becomes then, you know, why would the elimination uh, of, of waste or the significant reduction of waste solve that problem? Now, I think we, we all grew up with, you know, I know in, in my family we would say, finish what's on your plate because people in China are, are starving. Um, now in China they say finish what's on your plate because people in, in the U.S. are, are starving. But nonetheless, if we felt finished what's on our plate, we'd all be a lot, a lot bigger. So, so, so that's not an answer. Um, I, I would have to say that the environmental um, factors, uh, the wasted resources, and the wasted land and that are, are compelling aspects of providing enough capacity to increase food production if we need to in the future. But I could also solve that problem by reducing the amount of animal products that we produce and consume in this country and around the world to levels that are healthy for us and our diets and for the planet. So that in itself is, is in a sense a concept of waste by simply producing foods that we shouldn't be eating and then consuming them. So it's a kind of a structural uh, part of it. And, and so I, I think I'll stop at that, but I just wanted to make that point because I, I don't quite see the, the, the ease of saying if we could get rid of all the waste today or in, before 2050, that people in 2050 are all going to get fed. Well, I think we could. 
Um, I think the challenge is in doing it, right? And I haven't. There are going to be a lot of people, and we need to have a lot of people thinking about how to do that, right? So we've said for decades that um, the problem of hunger in the world is a distribution problem, right? And um, as you said, we don't we don't get the food to all the people that need it, right? So I think we're entering a new era where we can get it. It's it's still a very difficult issue, but um, I think we're going to advance. Uh, with proper thinking and a concerted effort to do it, I think there are ways to um, make a lot of headway in terms of capturing this excess um, and actually getting it to people into places that um, that need it. Um, you know, we have a couple of thousand food banks in the country in the country right now that that work on this, you know, at local and regional levels to. Um, abate hunger in their communities, right? So, um, and the fact, as you mentioned, and as we saw in here, that we, um, you know, we produce enough food now to feed the world, and, and we, um, you know, if we reduce that and we capture a quarter of that food, we would feed the planet. I, it's just, um, I, I think there are, with different thinking and, and different technologies and different commitments um, and, and global commitments to doing that, I guess my perspective is um, we're going to have to capture that food. I'm not saying it's easy, but we're going to have to do it. Um, and we can't just simply continue to operate um, and leave a billion people um, without adequate nutrition. Um, so I guess my perspective would be, though not easy, um, we can do it, we, and I, I don't think we have a choice to do it. So I guess sorry, I would differ. <laughs> Debbie Miller, and thank you, Steve, for the compassion that moves you to go out and take those pictures, you know, and see the pain that you know is behind the implications of that. Two points. Um, I tend to think bottom line thinking, and the bottom line in this case is thermodynamics. Um, if you buy a gas like Gessler car, it will get you to zero to sixty real fast. If you buy a Prius, it won't. And the difference is power. And this is a power relationship. If you want power, you have to waste a lot of expenditures. Uh, profit is equal to power. That's the analogy. We have created a system that maximizes profit for the people at the top. Um, the only way to do that is to create a very wasteful system. And they know that. So we're offering, not we're, the solutions we're saying is, but it would save us a huge amount of cost Conservation does not make for profit making. Conservation saves everybody in our expenses, but doesn't create the, diff the imp imbalance for the people at the top. So we really have to recognize that if we're going to change this paradigm, we will have to change the profit making paradigm of capitalism. The idea that we can have great profits to do what we do simply doesn't work from a thermodynamic, energetic perspective. So that's the first thing. I think we just have to recognize there are people at the top who make it wasteful so that they can make profits. And if we change it, make it much more balanced, they won't have it. So we can't argue profitability of business, although I agree that business can be brought in. They can't be brought in by saying they'll make more profits because conservation will never do that. It saves costs for everybody. The second thing is, why did they do that? How did they do that? And why are we so gullible? And I think there we have to look seriously at one of the greatest technological achievements of the 20th century, at least from the perspective of capitalism, and that is the evolution of the psychological principles by which um, demand creation has been achieved. Advertising and the way we are constantly swimming in a media that is telling us, a commercial media that is telling us what we want and how uh, mercurial our tastes need to be to stay abreast of what we want. And so we live in a very waste uh, consumptive society. So again, that's something we have to look at, but also we have to look at how it's come about and what we do to start speaking out against the way the media have conditioned us to be materialists.
So I know it's a little complicated, but those two points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. I think you're. Uh, I agree with you on. Uh...